when I was in Guantanamo, I was drawing Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And I'm looking at him and thinking, you're the guy who blew up my city, and how can I render your beard with attractive curls? Hi, I'm Raihan Salam, and this is The Vice Podcast. I'm joined today by Molly Crabapple, an artist and writer, a columnist for Vice, and the author of the forthcoming Drawing Blood. Molly, thanks very much for joining me. Thank you for having me. A little while ago, I was looking at a photograph of a sea lion, and I was really struck by how human-like it was. Um, It had whiskers. It looked kind of like a handsome older man wearing some kind of a seal coat. And I thought to myself, you know, gosh, as an artist and someone who draws figures, what is it that you see when you see human beings? Do you see them as lumps of flesh, or do you see them as people with lives and personalities? You try to do both. When you draw someone, it's this very technical, aesthetic thing. You're looking at their face and you're breaking it down into planes and angles. And very often it becomes very surreal. When I was in Guantanamo, I was drawing Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And I'm looking at him and thinking, you're the guy who blew up my city, and how can I render your beard with attractive curls? Why attractive? I mean, it, tell me about prettiness and, and whether or not it matters to you. I mean, when you're drawing, do you want to make things beautiful? Is that what you're oriented towards? I want to make them visually interesting. Beauty is the wrong word. But Umberto Eco had a line where he said that if you take something that's hideous and you render it skillfully, it becomes beautiful. Art is the sort of transubstantiation, the sort of alchemy. So even if you're drawing the most horrible thing ever, you want to draw it in a way that will make people look, that will seize them. So much of the work that you uh, do is kind of documentary work. And I wonder, is that something that came to you very early on in your career as an illustrator? I think a lot of times the reason that people become artists is because it gives them access to spaces that they wouldn't otherwise get. In short, we were the doofy, unpopular kids who would try to bribe our way into the good lunch table by drawing the cheerleaders, which is certainly something I did. I always viewed... Is that literally true? Oh, yeah. I also drew people so that they wouldn't hit me when I was younger. And so your sketchbook, it becomes this kind of lockpick to the outside world. And you draw things because that's how you interact with them. I mean, I would use my sketch pad to get into fancy nightclubs that wouldn't let me pass the velvet rope. I would draw scenes in Morocco so that I could talk to kids there and they didn't think I was a doofy tourist. The sketch pad is always just this lockpick to the larger world. If you don't mind my asking, why would people have wanted to hit you? Um, you were very little at the time, I assume. Well, so were they. I mean, if, if they were little and you're little, then it's the same as if you're both big, right? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I guess your response to that was not to seek some larger redress or justice from a teacher, but rather to manage the situation internally and to kind of figure it out for yourself and to defend yourself by giving them something they might want. Do you feel like that's kind of generous to the people who otherwise would have been hitting you? You know, I guess I always rejected the entire system so thoroughly that it never occurred to me to turn to it for help. There's a whole history of artists doing that, too. In uh, the gulags, artists were actually quite sought after because they could draw criminals' kids. The art, it was a way to please the powerful and to provide an escape hatch. So you didn't think of that as compromising you in some way? I was 10. Though it continued. I mean, so this idea of wanting to see a wider... Tell me a little bit about where you grew up. I grew up in Far Rockaway and then Mm -hmm. later in Long Island. When I was living in Long Island, it was just, you know, boring suburb. I would sneak into the city from the time that I was 14. I'd stay out all night and go to the Halloween parade, worry my mom. And because I was never good at talking to people, I would just kind of stare creepily at them and sketch them if I wanted to get their attention. So when you talk about these drawings that you, you would give away many of these drawings, I assume, but but did you have some kind of record of these early years? I mean, kind of uh, of your tormentors or of the girls you admired at the, uh, in the cafeteria, et cetera. Did you have some kind of, did you eventually have some collection of these drawings? I have many, 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 many uh, sketch pads and journals that will probably never be seen. Uh, Why is that? Why do you kind of keep them close? So Leonardo da Vinci, the reason that we think he's really good, two reasons. First of all, he was obviously one of the greatest artists who ever lived. But second of all, in the Renaissance, 
artists pre preserved their reputations by burning everything they didn't like. Although, like, I wonder, uh, do you still edit that aggressively, or do you feel as though, do you feel more comfortable releasing your work? I've got to release them a lot more. I mean, we live in this time where images are so ubiquitous, right? You have your phone and you're Snapchatting and putting stuff on Instagram. So it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem quite as important to only release perfect things. Um, I did a thing a few months ago where I was at uh, Jeremy Hammond's, um, one of his hearings, and I did this little drawing in court, and his hearing took so short, and I have this little scribble. Tell us a bit about Jeremy Hammond. Uh, Jeremy Hammond is a hacker who um, was one of the people responsible for the Strat4 hack. And I was at the, um, the hearing of his where he pleaded guilty. Hmm. And, you know, it's so fast. I mean, those hearings, they're just the fastest thing to dispose of a human life. And I'm sitting there frantically drawing. And it's, it's really, it's not a good drawing. It's not something that I would expect money for or that, you know, I would put in my body of work. But it was immediate, you know. It was right from my eyes to my hands. And so I posted that because it was just immediate and real and there. What do you think it is that one gains from seeing drawings of that kind? given that we have so much you know, other material, so many other ways to kind of capture images from something like a hearing. Um, what is distinctive and what is valuable about having your eye translated through your hand to characterize this kind of a moment? Actually, a hearing is one of the only places where you wouldn't have other images. Mm. They don't allow cameras at them. In... But I assume you'd still do it even if you did have cameras. It's true. So. When you live in a world where photography is cheap, where everything is just subsumed under all this detail, where every time a cop hits a protester over the head, there's a million twit pics of it, it can ignore one, it can make one numb, makes your eyes glaze over. What drawing does is it restores a singularity and preciousness to an image. It also, it saves things from the memory hole. In Joe Sacco's Palestine, he interviews Palestinians who were interrogated. You know, obviously, this was done under conditions of intense secrecy. There were no cameras um, in the prisons where this was happening. But Sacco was able to take these people's memories and bring them to visual life. He was able to take something that people had tried to hide and bring it into the world again. You also often work with animals. You often render animals in your work, uh, anthropomorphic animals. Um, and I wonder. Um, Tell me a little bit about that. I mean, sort of, and, and, and tell me, when you're drawing an anthropomorphic animal, are you using an animal as a model, or are you just working from your imagination? I draw animals because they're good everyman. When you draw people, you're like, oh, is it a man? Is it a woman? Um, what's their race? What are they wearing? Does that look like someone I would know? I think his nose is too big. They're individuals. Whereas when you draw animals, you're able to draw sort of a stand-in for people without worrying too much who those people are. Hmm. One thing that always strikes me about anthropomorphic animals is to see what it is we highlight or exaggerate in the animal's countenance to make it seem human-like, and then what that tells us about what we register in other human beings. When you render a human being, what are the first places you go to, uh, you know, when you kind of have a blank canvas and then I'm about to capture? Uh, how do you start? How Do you work your way from the outside in? Do you work your way from the inside out? I mean, how does it... So you start with a line. Like, let's say I was drawing you right now. So I'd start with a swoop like this for how your spine is going. Then I'd do another line for your shoulders, and then I'd draw an egg for your head. I'd start dividing the egg up into um, thirds, you know, a line for your eyes, line down the center. And then I would start blocking things in from that and getting more and more specific. And I would look at, I would look at the parts of your face that were biggest and smallest. I would look at like what is the difference between your face and like you know a smiley face blank. And then that would be what makes you. And I would try to get that right. You often use smiley face blanks. Um, Tell me a bit about this convention and where it came from. I use them in my Guantanamo work. In Guantanamo Bay, there is really strict censorship. You're not allowed to draw the faces of the guards. And I wanted to draw the censorship. I didn't want to like, turn the guards to the sides or draw the back of their heads or cover up for them that they were banning me from drawing things. 
So I uh, developed these sort of blank masks. They're actually not smiley faces. The mouth is just motionless blank. A non-smiley face. Yeah, but not a frowny face, just mm. a neutral face. Hmm. Uh, what did they make of the non-smiley blank faces? They laughed their asses off about them. Um, when I got out of court, uh, the court censor, he's looking through my book, seeing that I didn't draw any of their faces, seeing I didn't draw cameras. And he just looked up and he was like, well, I never saw that solution before. He put his little approved sticker on it. So you mentioned growing up in the suburbs, going to New York at age 14. And I assume this was part of the time when you were talking your way into different settings through the power of your, your sketching and what have you. Is that, is that fair to say? You A were drawing? Mm -hmm. So what was the idea of the world that you wanted to be a part of? Like, did you have a sense of kind of the things you wanted to see and the, the things you wanted to do? I was obsessed with biographies. And uh, I lived near this thrift store that sold books for 10 cents a book. And so I would like go down there with my dollar and I'd buy 10 books at a time. And um, one time I just found Anais Nin's Delta of Venus. And like every single proto-goth girl, I look at the cover of the girl with her stockings and her cloche hat and I read it and I'm like, oh my God, this is fantasy idealized Paris. This is the most beautiful place in the world. This is where I want to be. And it became this like aesthetic fetish, this mold that I would chase throughout my entire life. Even though I don't like her work anymore, I think she's a total twit. I, I'd probably uh, insult her and then steal her clothing actually. But just that, that aesthetic mold, that idea of this, this city where, you know, there are fabulous parties and cafes and artists and artists and journalists and radicals and people who are building things would all go drinking together. That sort of, that sort of demimonde, I guess, was my mental fetish. That was my, my talisman that I always wanted. Was goth culture something you knew about and you were aware of its conventions at that age uh, what, when you stumbled on this book or was this something that happened later? I think I was kind of a bad goth girl. Like, I didn't listen to The Cure. I didn't have a very sophisticated musical understanding. I never went clubbing at all. But I, I kind of knew about it. I, I sent away for issues of, like, the, what was it called? The Gothic Renaissance catalog. And I would dream about someday I might be able to have that black floaty dress. Or I would uh, I'd read Ma Maximum Rock and Roll and uh, subscribe to zines and stuff. I think I had an, an incomplete understanding of goth would be how I would put it, I, I, but I, there wasn't like a scene or anything. What were your first encounters with it? How did you first stumble on this aesthetic? Fact Sheet 5. Do you, do you remember Fact Sheet 5? I don't. So Fact Sheet 5 was this amazing, um, it was basically like a gigantic catalog of zines. And I shoplifted a copy of Fact Sheet 5 from the bookstore, and I would look through it, and I would just send away for every single free zine. The thrift store or another oh, bookstore? The, another bookstore. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I should I would not, more in stealing from would, those guys. I don't think that they would have Fact Sheet 5 <laughs> in the thrift store either. I, think, yeah. I don't think someone would have donated that. <laughs> but I would send away for these, these zines, which at the time you could just like send two stamps away, and you would get one. And I think that was actually where I kind of came across it, which is a very isolated, loner way to come across it. Were there any other goths around you? I think there were definitely weird kids. It was that time right after Kurt Cobain had died where if you were like sort of a lonely, isolated kid, you would dye your hair with Kool-Aid and be like, Kurt understood me. I'm, I'm very fascinated by goth culture, partly because you see lots of different groups gravitating towards it. For example, you have this big Chicano goth thing happening. And I always wonder, I mean, I guess there's a kind of moodiness among adolescents, and perhaps it appeals to that. But just the idea of a culture with a canon, yet that seems kind of artificial. It's something that's really striking. And, and I guess to some degree, it exists in dialogue with other cultural trends or other cultural currents. Was there something that the Goths were not a part of that was a coherent thing, another coherent cultural kind of understanding or sensibility that you were rejecting by embracing Goth? I mean, I think, I'm trying to remember what was like the mainstream music in that era. It's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, I think like early Britney Spears, like, you know, belly shirt and a big smile type thing. 
But I mean, aren't all cultures artificial? You know, all new cultures, at least. I mean, isn't that how you how you make a culture? Yeah, I think you're right. And then it just stays around for a long time, and it seems natural because people were born into it. But you're you aren't the first artist in your family. I understand your mother was also an illustrator. And my great grandfather. Tell me about how that influenced you. It influenced me hugely. I think with a lot of families, there's this idea that art is this like foo foo thing that you can never make a living at. But my mom, she's an illustrator, and in this like very like sort of working class way, where, you know, she would like go to the off, you know, she would like go to an office and, and draw things, and then go home, and she'd like be working all night doing freelance projects and stuff. So illustration always, to me, just was like, oh, that's how my mom makes her modest living. You know, it, it wasn't. There is nothing fantastical or foo foo about it at all. It was just that's how adults put food on the table. They make a physical object, and then they trade it for money. Was this something you would do alongside her when she was working on a freelance project? Would you also be at the dining room table drawing yourself? She would definitely critique my work. She would look at it, and she'd be like, you know, a nose is not an upside-down seven. Don't draw it like that. The sky, it's not a little blue strip on the top. I definitely think it helped me. My mom's always been a better artist than me. She's crazy, crazy good. She draws a lot like me, but with a lot more care and sweetness, I would say, because she comes more from a, a children's children's book, children's toy background. Interesting. So uh, was so being a professional illustrator, did she have some other aspiration earlier on in life? Or was this something that she always felt, you know, this is something that I'm good at, but, you know, not necessarily something that she thought of as a vocation? No, that's always what she wanted to do. She always drew from the time she was a little girl. Um, she went to college to draw. Um, she got a jo got her first jobs drawing. Um, it was just, you know, it was her trade. So she encouraged you, I assume, in your efforts as well. She did, and she did some. She did one thing that was very good for me, which was I got into a very very fancy and expensive art school, and I was like, I really wanted to do it. And she just told me, "You're never going to make enough money, you know, doing this." I, I know, <laughs> and she wouldn't. She wouldn't let me go. And at the time, I was so angry, but it meant that I never had debt ever. And that was definitely something that changed and shaped my life, and something where I'm really grateful for her professional experience, telling me not to do something dumb. You mentioned your great grandfather. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about his work. So my great grandfather was um, a Russian Jewish commie who immigrated to America back when there was still the Tsar, and he did these kind of post-impressionist paintings. He had this moment where he probably could have been successful, but then, like a lot of people, he decided that everyone in New York were a bunch of phonies, and he moved to a farm in the middle of nowhere and never really became successful, even though he did art till he died. But my, in my family, there was always just this legend of this. Uh, my great uncle also was a painter, uh, too. But yeah, there was this, this legend of um, you know painting and how he had painted and how he had turned his like little home in um, in Brooklyn into a home museum and would like drag out his paintings onto the lawn every day and you know try to try to get the neighbors to interested in his work. And again, it was always that thing where art was never a rebellion for me. It was following in the family tradition. And in fact, it seemed like the most sensible way to make a living. I mean, it's very concrete. You, you make something with your own hands and then, you know, it's good. People like it. They give you money for it. It's not like some foo-foo thing like marketing or, um, or philosophy or, you know, it, there's, nothing, there's nothing abstract about it. It's just, it just is. But of course, there is a marketing component, right? I mean, I think about the Occupy movement and, you know, some argue that uh, some of the conventions and language of Occupy grew out of ad busters. And these are guys who are in incredibly savvy about the world of marketing and advertising and the idea of creating iconic images and spreading them. Uh, and it seems that in your work, you've similarly been very thoughtful and savvy about how to make your images relevant and to connect with a wider audience. So uh, tell me about that, the role of marketing. Uh, and you know, Because it sounds that you're, you know, as though you're a little dismissive of marketing, but it oh, certainly I'm, seems. I'm, I'm not dismissive of marketing. I just, I've never worked in an office before. So yeah. I, don't, I, don't even, I don't even understand the um, social and economic interplay of like getting a job in, in marketing is what mm -hmm. I mean. Mm -hmm. And it just always seemed more direct to make physical object and sell it. So what were the first things that you sold? Well, when I was in 
when I was 17, I would put up flyers in all of the bodegas offering to draw people's pets for $20. I'm sorry, when was this? When I was 17. Got it. Offering, yeah, offering to draw people's pets for $20. Why pets? Because they're really easy. They're much easier than people. I mean, you kind of have an idea of what your cat looks like, but you really know what your kid looks like. Fascinating. I would think that drawing a pet would be far more difficult than drawing a human. Oh, God, no. Also, if you're drawing someone's wife or their kid, you, they're sensitive, like, did you make my kid look ugly? Right. Whereas, like, it's pretty hard to make the cat look ugly. You can, but it's harder. Yeah. Fascinating. And how did that go? It was good. I drew a lot of people's pets. I, I also, um, I talked like the local espresso bar into letting me draw his favorite jazz musicians uh, for $100, which at the time I was like, golly gee, $100, I'm rich. And I, I would draw people's D&D characters. Wow. So, uh, you know, uh, did you ever work a kind of more conventional job during this period of time? Or? No, I didn't. <laughs> I, I also, um, I worked as a really low rent naked model booking through Craigslist, which was kind of my day job. I actually wrote about that for Vice also. Got it. And and this was, I mean, uh, around the time you were uh, in a high school student, is that right? Um, no, I started college when I was 17. So I, start, I see, And I, I started working as a model when I was 18. Got it. And did modeling shape your artwork at all? I mean, the experience of, um, you know, being present for other people in that way, did that inform your work in any way? Um, in many, many ways. I think one thing is a lot of girls, we have this idea that we want to, like, be a muse, you know, we want, like, an artist to immortalize us. But muses don't keep copyright. Muses are always fucked over. Look, look at Edie Sedgwick. Being a muse is a totally precarious and ultimately unappreciated position. And I think that modeling utterly killed that desire in me. And because I realized, like, I'm standing here freezing, covered in strawberry jam, while this rather untalented photographer is taking very, very unflattering photos of me, and he's calling me a muse. But th this is nothing. I want to make my own art. I want to make something that lasts. It gave me this real sort of education in power dynamics and money and the power that money gives and how disposable you are when you're young and you don't have any of it. I wonder also about the, well, so you obviously have to work with models yourself from time to time and, and obviously documentary work, it's not quite working with a model, but you're observing others. Uh, do you feel a sense of responsibility to those uh, you're capturing in your work? I do. I mean, art is always objectification. You are literally like taking someone, taking this real living, thoughtful human being, and you're making them into an object that you can later sell. Good when, God. I mean, that sounds totally right, but it sounds incredibly dark. It's a bit dark. I mean, I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of hedging around that in art, but it's true. And hopefully what you do when you make that person the object, you make the object good enough that it gives something back, you know, that it pays an homage to them, at least if you like the person. I got my start drawing burlesque dancers and drawing sex workers and drawing sort of the nightlife. And these are people I fucking worshipped. I thought that these people were like alchemists who were making the pain and dross of daily living into gold on stage. And I wanted to do something good. I wanted to do something that captured that, that added to that. I specifically did not want to draw them just like pretty shells. I wanted to draw them as the artists, the personas they were. It's a little different when I'm drawing someone I don't like. Um, when I was in Gitmo, I drew this guy named uh, Rear Admiral Butler, who was, he was responsible for all the prisons. He's kind of a, a sinister figure who decorated his office with giant blown up photographs of shackled detainees. And I, I can't say I, I liked him much. And so when, when I drew him, I was trying to get, I was trying to capture what it was about him, but I wasn't thinking like, will he feel good about himself afterwards? Will he think that I made his jaw square? Tell me about when you walk away from something, when you feel as though a drawing is complete. I know that sounds a little odd, but just yeah, talk me through that because um, I always feel as though when drawing, you can just always add more lines. You can always add more detail. And you know, so when I draw, uh, oftentimes anyone will, they'll just become grotesque over time. It's just, you know, kind of, perhaps it's just in my nature. I mean, I think that I'm drawn to the grotesque. I make things grotesque. Um, but you don't. I mean, you know, you stop well before that begins. Yeah. I mean, how does that work? I have a lot of drawings to do. That, that would be the short answer. 
Um, the, the longer answer is with my pen and ink, like I wanna get a sense of freshness and, and violence and emotion. And it is absolutely anathema to that. It's just like go eh, 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 and draw like a million lines for me. The thing where I do, I would do that is my paintings because I'm almost, I'm almost newer to that. Like the first time I did large scale paintings was for my show, Shell Game. And they're six feet tall. They take a month and a half to do of like 14 hours a day. And when you're there, you just feel like you can fall into them. You're, you have this tiny brush. Like my brush, it's, um, I don't know, it's about as fine as a needle maybe. And I have the six foot tall canvas and I'm just there like trying to make everything perfect, trying to make it like glow, trying to put life force into it. You use the term shell a lot. So your show was called Shell Game, and you were referring to your reluctance to make these burlesque dancers into beautiful shells. Um, and I wonder about that. Um, how does one render the kind of flesh underneath the surface, particularly in you know what is necessarily a two-dimensional drawing? Um, what are the techniques that you use to give something life to make it feel vital? I try to draw people I know. I try not to just use anonymous models. That's not really my thing. I want to draw someone who I've gotten drunk with, who I've bullshitted with, who I know her funny smile and her sarcastic streak. And I want to try to get that into the piece as well. So you try to capture movement. You try to capture, you know, even though it's a still image, you're trying to kind of convey the liveliness of, uh, of your subject. Well, for instance, if I was drawing you, like I might notice how you look down, you sort of look up from under your brows. Like I might use that gesture, or I might use, you know, your, your laughter and um, like the little V in the center of your lip. Like there are all these things that I would think of as like you, and I would try to get those things as opposed to just, you know, a random snapshot, which could look like anything. What was your first journalistic work? My, f my first journalistic piece, well, first, I, um, my first piece ever, like the first professional piece I ever wrote was uh, last year for CNN, which I, was me writing about my arrest at Occupy. But my first journalistic piece, I guess that was last um, December, no, November. I went to Spain and I did um, a bit of work about the Spanish general strike and also about the squatters in Seville. But surely that wasn't the first time you had drawn something, you know, kind of that you had seen, that kind of documentary kind of thing. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant my, my writing. Um, the, first, the first explicitly journalistic drawing I did where I thought of it as journalism, because, I mean, th that's always the thing. Like, there's stuff where you're just drawing what's around you in your yeah. sketch pad, and then there's what you think of as, you know, recording, was probably going down to Occupy and drawing the protesters. Although I, I do wonder, and I want to talk about that, but also it's it's interesting to me. So you think of the writing as this separate kind of endeavor. Was writing something that was important to you earlier on as well? Were you doing writing more informally for yourself, for your own purposes, to kind of um, capture your experiences? Or would you say that the way you captured your experiences was primarily through sketching? I always wanted to be a writer when I was younger. I even slogged my way through this like horrific novel that I, in high school. I mean, it's two, it's 200 pages. I'm proud of finishing that, but it's 200 of the worst pages that one might ever read. It's better than you think, but fair enough. Writing was just always really hard for me and drawing was really easy. I, um, I never ever sit down to a piece of art and I'm like, can I do this? I know I can do it. Is it because you were more of a perfectionist about your writing than about sketching? I think that there are more ways to fuck up writing maybe. Like drawing is essentially so subjective. Like. You can, you know, have the big black swirl at the bottom, or you can like tightly render things. Like there's so many ways to do it. Whereas with my own writing, at least, I, I just always felt like there was, you know, a few ways to do it right, and then these massive chasms of fail. And I, I just wasn't good at it for a really long time. So what changed? What allowed you? What gave you the confidence to start writing? Um, a few things. The first was I went to Greece with this amazing young journalist, Laurie Penny, and we did a project called Discordia that life under the Eurozone crisis, and she wrote it, and I illustrated it. And being with her was almost like an apprenticeship. I got to see how she interviewed people. I got to see how notes became the finished thing. Like, I got to kind of observe a really amazing writer doing their job all the way through. And then when I got arrested, I was just really angry, and I, I wanted to yell about it from the loudest podium that I could get on.
And you're working now on a new project with Matt Taibbi, who is, of course, very well known for having uh, covered the financial crisis and its aftermath, but uh, also spent some time earlier on the former Soviet Union and has had a very storied career as a journalist. And now you guys are collaborating on a new project. Yes, I'm illustrating his new book, The Divide, which is about the criminal justice system and the different ways it treats poor people and rich people. I'm, he's one of my favorite journalists in the world. I'm so fucking honored that I get to work with him. And I'm doing tons and tons of these interior illustrations about, of scenes that people might not see, like the line of women visiting their man at Rikers or the inside of a welfare office. How is that collaboration working? Is it the kind of thing where he will write some prose and then send it to you and then you'll illustrate it from there? Or are you also part of the reporting? I mean, are you present in these spaces? Um, I only went to one place with him. I went to misdemeanor court once with him. And um, I, drew, I drew the scene there. But besides that, it's just he gave me a manuscript and then we discussed what I would draw. <laughs> Is this something you hope to do more of in the future, this kind of collaboration? Or do you imagine being both the writer and the artist uh, in the next project? I like working myself a lot, but there are just some people who are so amazing that I would love to work with them like that. So earlier on, you had mentioned uh, those sketches uh, from Occupy. Uh, and I wonder, when the movement erupted, when it came on the scene, was this something that you connected to as an artist, thinking, you know, ah, this will be a fascinating subject. There will be people in the streets. There will be a, a wide array of different people. This will be a lot of neat and challenging images for me to work with. Or was there something else at work, too? Oh, God, no. I, I, t I fucking agreed with it. Like, I got arrested at it. You know, my friends got arrested at it. Like, I, it was the most vital, pressing thing I had seen in America for a long time. It moved me so much. And when did it become clear to you that it was something that was going to be very important to you? Was it, you know, from the first day, from the first moment, or was it something that uh, took time to... At first, I was really cynical. I thought it was a bunch of dudes with white guy dreads and bongos, and that it was just going to be another one of these sort of failed wannabe... Which are, by the way, very compelling to draw. Dreads and bongos. I can see the dreads, like kind of like tentacles mm -hmm. swirling around. Bongos, I disagree with you on. Respectfully disagree. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought it was just going to be one of these like failed, like left, lefty, um, you know, wannabe hippie projects that doesn't speak to anyone but itself. And then I, there was the day where they took over Broadway. That, that was the same day that um, those girls got pepper sprayed. And I was just looking at the crowd, and I was looking at how diverse it was. I was looking you know, at how many old people, how many young people there were, how many people of different races. And I was like, these people are fucking, they're for real, and they're willing to get beaten up. And this is, this is important. This is really important. So I wonder, was it important because it created a compelling story that other people could connect to? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. I, uh, well, one thing that I, I always wonder about is just um, how, I guess I think of the world through the, through the idea of stories and narrative and the idea that we all hunger for it. Uh, we all want some narrative for our own life, just to understand our own life. And then we like the idea of connecting to larger stories. It's the reason why we might connect with a political movement or a sports team or whatever else, but the idea of some kind of story uh, that can help us make sense of our lives. So yeah, I guess I'm just kind of wondering if what it was about that story that you found most compelling. Oh, I absolutely agree with you, what you're saying there. I mean, for one thing, it was the first time in a long time where the left actually felt like it mattered and it felt dangerous. I think a lot of people, they, they had voted for Obama, they had you know worked really hard for him, I know I did. And then they saw that President Obama was very different than candidate Obama. And it led to a breakdown in faith and representative democracy. Like, what's the point of working really hard and you know giving your all to elect this guy who seems amazing when he just stops being amazing the minute he's elected? And people wanted something instead that was participatory and direct, where they weren't voting for leaders who, you know, to build the ideal world. They were trying to build it themselves. And I mean, obviously, Zuccotti Park was not a utopia, it, you know, in, in any sense, but it. It had, it had aspirations for that, for a place where people would help each other. What were the things that disappointed you about it? 
the General Assemblies got really, really uh, dysfunctional and became dominated by people being really cruel to each other. A lot of things didn't get done because consensus-based decision-making is really hard and doesn't scale. Um, May Day was supposed to be an amazing resurrection. It just wasn't. I mean, it was a lovely day, but it was not, it was not the, um, the sort of rebirth of the movement that people thought it would be. For me, Occupy was a success. What happened during Sandy was amazing. Uh, strike Debt, which is a program where people, they buy medical debt at pennies to a dollar and then cancel the debt is also an amazing and innovative thing. And I do think it changed the discourse about wealth, but it also was really crushed by a brutal, brutal NYPD response and also by internal dysfunction. Do you think that without, in the absence of the, the NYPD response that uh, it might have evolved into something quite different? Do you think that the dysfunction would have been overcome? I, I like to think so, yes. I mean. By the end, you couldn't even have a march without, you know, five to one cops outnumbering you, barricading off streets, pulling people into the streets and arresting them. Like when I got arrested, I um, I wasn't doing anything civil disobedience. I was I'm just not a very brave person. I was just standing on a street corner two blocks from my house, and a cop grabbed me and pulled me into the street and you know stuck me in jail for eleven hours. People they get burned out and they get tired on that and. It just starts, the, and the marches itself, they, they just get crushed, and it starts feeling like you just can't do this. How has the spirit of Occupy continued to inform your work? How has it changed the way you collaborate with others or the, uh, or the issues that you tackle? It made me a lot more political. I had always been a political person, just in a personal way. Um, but I was not a political artist before Occupy. I would kind of... I just do kind of mean subversive things. Like when I was working as the house artist for the box, I convinced them to make the symbol of their customers, Coke Tell snorting us a bit pigs. About the box. I imagine some of our, our viewers might not know about it. Uh, the box is a nightclub that maybe four years ago was like the hottest nightclub in New York City. And it was this place where stockbrokers and Saudi princes would blow through $10,000 a night on champagne while the most beautiful porn stars and the most brilliant circus performers were doing these really depraved Weimar, like contemptuous acts on stage that were brilliant. Hmm. It was the most astounding place to artistically come of age in. And what did it mean to be the house artist? I, get to, I would sit on the um, stage every single night on this little cushion that they had for me, and I would draw, I would just draw notebook after notebook. And then whenever they needed something, I would draw it. Like I drew giant backdrops for them, or I would, I would draw tat fake tattoos and body paint on all of the wait staff, or I would draw their menu borders, just sort of whatever they needed, I would do. How long did that job, how long was it stimulating? It lasted for about four years, three and a half, three that and a half years. That sounds exhausting. That I, sounds like a really punishing schedule. I wouldn't go every single night. I mean, it, yeah. wasn't, it wasn't like a job where I had to, you know, be somewhere for eight hours. It was right. like, um, almost like being on retainer, I would say. Yeah. The most amazing thing that I did for them was I did a gigantic 90-foot mural at their club in London. And it was under the most brutal conditions. Like, it's November, there's no heating. The water is like freezing in my hands. And I'm scrubbing paint into this raw linen. There's like asbestos dust and green dust. And it's just, it's just hell, but it felt like the St. Teresa-style art martyrdom. I remember the last day I drew a, uh, pictures of all of the construction workers on the tiles of the VIP room. I, I wonder, when you start out on a project of that scale, does the prospect of doing that intimidate you when you get started? Or, or, or do you just have a very clear vision of where you want to get to at the end and you just work your way towards it? Or is it more improvisational than that? You just kind of work your way through it and the mood that you have on any given day is going to shape what's happening in the mural? It's improvisational. I. I just sort of pour my head out onto the wall, and it's brutal. Like by the end, by the end of that job, I remember there was this wall. It was like the last thing. It was right next to the VIP room, and my hands were so in pain from painting like this. I'm just looking at it. And I'm like, "You are gonna break, or I'm gonna break wall." And you know, I did it. But then I was curled up in this fetal position, and my assistant's like poking me and being like, "Get up, get up. You know, we have to 
have to get some celebratory drinks. But I guess at the start, I'm always an egomaniac, and then I'm stubborn, and then at the end, I get broken. You seem to value endurance and the ways in which some of your work is a kind of feat of endurance. Uh, why is that? It's an interesting question. I never thought about that before. I think to do something good, you have to endure and you have to have a bit of pain and there has to have a bit of struggle. And I think that if you're not able to do those things, if you only do things that feel good, if you only do things that are easy, if you don't stretch yourself, you never create anything of value at all. So when I am able to break through what I thought I could do, it's something I, I try to cultivate in myself so that I could do more of it because I know that if I'm ever going to create anything great, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to have that in much greater quantities than I have now. So you try to bite off more than you can chew just to kind of drive yourself to the point of failure so that you can stretch what you're capable of doing. Exactly. What are some of the things going forward that you think of as quite ambitious that might really tax you, but you'd like to see if you can do or not? I'm fucking terrified of doing my book, um, which I haven't started yet, but once, I, once I'm done with Taibi's book, actually, I'm probably going to lock myself up in a hotel and start writing that. Writing is so hard for me. It's so much harder than art. With art, it's always just physical endurance, whereas with writing, it's trying to keep your mind sharp while you're doing that. This isn't the first time you've locked yourself up in a hotel room. Tell us a little bit about uh, when you've done it before. I did a project called Week in Hell where I locked myself up in the Gramercy Park Hotel. We covered all the walls in paper and I drew 270 feet of art in a week. And the reason I wanted to do that was I was so fucking sick of myself. I was sick of my work. I was sick of like drawing like girls with big tits and curly hair. And I was like, is there even anything to me beyond what I hack out for money? What? And so I decided that what I needed to do is I just needed to draw so much that all the cliches got out of me and I got to see what was really mine. How'd it turn out? I thought it was pretty good. But were you really in the room, locked up for seven days? Yeah. You didn't leave? No. Now, this must have struck the hotel staff as quite suspicious. It was a fancy hotel. Maybe they thought I was on a Coke binge. <laughs> so you had warned them of what you were planning on No, I doing. didn't. We actually, we actually got this. We, we borrowed this really fancy suitcase from one of my fans, and we cut down the ro these giant rolls of paper and filled the entire suitcase with that. And then me and my assistant, we went in kind of like, like a couple, you know, with our big fancy suitcases. And then we, we got in, called the maid, told her not to show up for the week, and um, then just wallpapered the place. I, that just seems astonishing to me, partly because, you know, I wonder about uh, just claustrophobia. I mean, you didn't feel kind of penned in. I mean, you didn't feel oppressed. It was a big room. I, mean, room. It was, it was, I mean, it was a suite, you know. Yeah. Was, do you no. spend a lot of time indoors generally? I do, yeah. I'm an artist. <laughs> okay, That's well, what we do. Well, that makes more sense then. Uh, so what did you find out about yourself at the end of that week? What, you know, with the freedom to do that, with the freedom to just do whatever came to mind, uh, what were some of the things that kind of emerged? I realized I didn't have to think small anymore. I think that was the biggest thing. Before that, I had always been so constrained. I mean, since I've always made my living off of my artwork, like I would always think of my work before that as like, what can I make money from? How much money do I have? You know, it was like just always like this very uh, survival-based way of thinking about it. And when I did Week in Hell, I was able to get beyond that and think, holy fuck, I could, I could, I could make anything. I could make anything I wanted to. How did it feel that, you know, a pretty decent number of people were willing to give you money um, to allow you to realize this project? I mean, was it energizing? It was incredibly humbling. I couldn't believe it. I, when I did the project, I was almost embarrassed to put it out because I was like, oh, this is like my little art wank vision quest. You know, people, why the fuck would I, people give me money for this? And um, I mean, I asked for $5,000 and people gave me 25000 for it. And I, yeah, I was in incredibly humbled. I love my fans. I would not have a career if it wasn't for the internet. I was never someone like that, like fancy galleries or universities or like gatekeepers like wanted to back and get behind. I always was able to do what I was able to do because a lot of normal people liked me. 
What do you think it is about you that they find compelling? I'm sure you've engaged with some of them. I mean, you know, are there any things that you hear from them about what they find particularly compelling about your work, why they connect to you, why they're willing to open their wallets to you when necessary? God, I feel really, I feel really, really wanky about, you know, uh, of course. Qu- quoting, quoting, quoting the fan letters. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think... I think a lot of people they, they like my, my fuck Eunice and they find it a bit inspiring. And a number of women have written to me and they said that I am, I am fearless. And I always kind of object to that. I mean, for me, like brave people are people who are running around in war zones with cameras. You know, it's not brave to lock yourself in a hotel room and draw a lot. But that's definitely something people have said about my work, even if I, I don't agree. Does that response lead you to list in one direction or another? Does it kind of shape your work? Does it kind of have this kind of tropism effect where you start doing more of one thing and less of another? Not really. I mean, there are two aspects to my work. Like there's the work like Week in Hell or Shell Game where, or my Guantanamo work where it's like this, you know, it's like the fucking, it's the fucking product of my soul, you know? But then there's also just drawings that I do for money as a trade. Um, so, like, if I'm, if I'm, like, making merchandise, like, I, I'll totally make the sort of things that I know my fans will like on merchandise. But um, in terms of what I'm doing, you know, for myself, it doesn't really affect it at all. You talk about Guantanamo speaking to your soul, and I wonder what it's like. You're dealing with people who are incredibly isolated, uh, who feel... I imagine you know many of them are, are in tremendous despair. Um, what is it like to render someone like that, uh, and to possibly be the only person who is kind of you know highlighting this person's existence? I, I don't think I'm the only person. There are some amazing reporters that are covering Guantanamo, but it's this very strange thing. I, I only saw the detainees once in my two trips there, and it was for seven minutes. We saw them through one-way mirrors, and so it was very dark, and they looked like these people preserved in amber. And there were these, you know, middle-aged guys, you know, middle-aged skinny dudes talking with each other, you know, like they knew each other really well, which they did. And it was the strangest thing, because you're like right next to them, but they're like universes away from you, you know? Why were you motivated to cover the story? What was the original impetus for it? The original impetus was that I, I had a chance to, and... How did that arise? I mean, it doesn't often happen that someone who, you know, is known for drawings of burlesques, uh, you know, is brought to Guantanamo to, you know, draw detainees or to just, you know, capture the general scene. Um, my friend John Neffel is a national security reporter for Rolling Stone, and he had gone there down there several times, and... I just asked him for his press contact and wrote to them. And I didn't think they would say yes. I mean, like, in fact, I was completely convinced that it wouldn't happen. Um, right until the, I got on the plane, I was completely convinced it was going to fall through. But they did say yes. And I thought that I would have the opportunity to see something that other people couldn't, and that I could see it differently from most of the people who went, because I was an artist, not a national security reporter. And did the experience exceed your expectations? Did it meet them? Did it? It was so much more fucked up than I ever could have thought. It um, was the most censored environment I've ever been in. It, but I think what's so fucked up about Guantanamo is that, on one hand, you know, it's this notorious prison, and it is a scary-looking prison with barbed wire and, you know, solitary confinement cells and all of the guards, like, wearing face masks because people will throw shit at them. But on the other hand, it's this cheerful American town with a gift shop, and your press officers are like the most cheerful, wholesome, you know, big smiles, American people that you'll ever deal with, super charming and nice. And it's that disconnect. It's seeing people who are like indisputably like your people as an American. Like these are like the most American people um, doing or enabling horrible things. Tell me about the memoir. You mentioned the the idea that, you know, writing can be quite challenging, etc. Uh, yet, you know, you're someone who is still, you know, quite young, and, and you're someone who, you know, has a flourishing career, but you're by no means at the end of your career. So uh, how do you, how do you think about that? I mean, you know, how do you kind of 
so is the idea that you're going to capture some earlier part of your life uh, and then have some endpoint before the present? Or I wonder how you're thinking about telling the story. <laughs> I think I kind of want to do it like my Vice essays, where I would take things from my earlier life and I would use them to talk about larger issues of beauty or power or money or class. One of my favorite essays, and sort of the essay that is the inspiration for the book, is a piece I did for you guys called "Professional," um, called uh, "The World of a Professional Naked Girl," about when I was modeling and like sort of my thoughts on beauty from that, and also what it's like to work in a field where you know that you could be raped and killed, and there'd be no police response to it, and um, you know what it's like to be kind of a person who's beyond. Um, beyond the sort of privileged category of those that uh, society would protect. And it's a lot about, you know, just being, being a woman. And I liked that, I liked that the um, taking stories from my own life and using it to speak to larger things. So that's what I hope my book does. Tell me a little bit more about this idea of beauty and vulnerability. So when you were doing this modeling work, you put ads on Craigslist, uh, et cetera, yet, you know, uh, what was it that made the work so vulnerable? Uh, you're showing up to a stranger's hotel room and getting naked. And was that vulnerability part of why you stopped doing it, or was it... Uh... Oh, yeah. No, I, I got too freaked out by it by the end. Did you... Good God, that sounds uh, extremely, extremely frightening. Uh, I, I, do you know others who've continued to do this kind of work? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that now there's less monetary value for it because, like, there have been these sites that um, are really good sites but that connect, you know, amateur models and amateur photographers better, and so there's, like, more of a supply and demand. And there's also more accountability, I assume, when you have people who use the sites more than once? Yeah, yeah, there's more, there's more accountability, somewhat, you know. But, um, yeah, I, I'm, sure there, I'm sure there are still girls doing it. Um, since I um, was really working 10 years ago, um, most of the women who I'd been working with would have aged out of it. The work that you did uh, with the burlesque community, uh, did that, um, has that inclined you to do more advocacy work uh, regarding sex workers and, and that universe? Um, I actually saw my modeling work as sex work. Um, I, I don't really see um, burlesque as sex work, not because um, I think that like burlesque dancers are better than strippers because that's bullshit, but just because most burlesque dancers they're not workers. They're doing it as you know as more of a hobby, and I think that when you're doing something for a living, it you know changes the dynamic. Um, but yeah, definitely doing the modeling work I did really um, inclined me to do more work around that. One of my good friends, Audacia Ray, founded a magazine by and for sex workers called Spread that I got to do some illustrations for. And um, I do try to keep in touch with that community. And I think that they're some of the sharpest, smartest, bravest, and toughest men and women around. So Molly, you clearly think of yourself as an outsider, yet you have a ton of legitimacy now. Uh, there are a lot of people who are very excited about the work that you're doing. Uh, these collaborations that you have certainly speak to the esteem with which you're held by a lot of gatekeepers. Uh, I wonder, how has your perspective changed on highbrow, lowbrow, insider, outsider, as you've become more of an insider? I always feel like such a gutter snipe in the palace. I got to speak at Harvard recently, and I never graduated school. I dropped out because I was working, and I'm like sitting there, and I'm like, "Holy fuck! They're they're letting me in. They're letting they're listening to me. What the hell?" I I think boxes are bullshit. I think that the high low thing with art, like the, this is illustration, this is fine art, is essentially a class argument for keeping out working class kids who couldn't afford MFAs, and. I think that it leads to ignoring so many talented, smart people, and it's something that ultimately has only led to um, the high art world becoming increasingly irrelevant and increasingly just a playground for Russian oligarchs. Thanks very much, Molly. Thank you.